Welcome back to the Business Tech FinTech Conference 2022 here on South Africa's largest business news website. And after an unrelenting year of fighting cyber threats, the financial services sector should really expect more of the same, or perhaps even worse, as we see nation state hacking campaigns expected to mirror geopolitical tensions and ransomware gangs retooling to dodge increased scrutiny. That's according to an industry group report, the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center. It's known as the FSISAC, and it said in its annual report on cyber threats that global tensions could fuel further attacks by state-backed hackers and patriotic activists. And we see what's going on over in Europe at the moment, and financial services firms are in the crosshairs here. It's a great pleasure to be joined now by George Cheretes, who is a sales engineer team lead for EMEA at OpsWat. So George, great to have you present here. Tell us a little bit more about OpsWat before we talk about cyber threats and financial services firms. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here and have the, the opportunity to, to present today. Uh, so OpsWat is a cybersecurity company, of course, a uh, 20 years old cybersecurity company founded in 2002 in San Francisco. And ever since we're uh, fighting against uh, malware and uh, all kinds of threat actors to help our customers be more secure when it comes to uh, protecting their, their critical infrastructure. So that's well, what we do. Uh, thank you. I recall uh, probably three years ago, I think it was just before COVID, Warren Buffett, in his uh, annual letter to shareholders, ranks the various risks that he sees. And, you know, back then, it wasn't the risk of rising populism. It wasn't the risk of uh, too much leverage in the financial system. His number one risk was cybersecurity, and he saw these as weapons of mass destruction. Why are financial services firms particularly at risk here? Well, Michael, there's different factors that led to this. So in order to bring in operational efficiencies, enhance their competitive advantages and deliver better customer experience overall, uh, many of those financial services have embarked on digital transformation and cloud uh, computing adoption that can increase business operational and reputational risk if not appropriately secured. And here I'm referencing the shared responsibility model, for example, from the major cloud vendors. Um, due to the increased digitalization of uh, financial services and the great volume of sensitive uh, digital data, this sector has become a favorite playground for the financially motivated uh, criminals. Now, most attacks are motivated by uh, financial gains from either stealing or selling or, um, you know, like we've seen in, 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 in the last year or so, holding data for ransom that can easily be monetized uh, from the targeted organizations. Now, we, we've also seen some organizations willing to, to pay the ransom either to get it done quick, quickly or uh, you know, avoid uh, leaking that into the news and keep their uh, reputation clean. Financial services is also the most cyber attacked industry. According to Boston Consulting Group, for example, uh, cyber, uh, cyber attacks hit financial services firms 300 times more than any other business uh, every year. Now, within the financial services sector, banks are the most uh, obvious target for cyber criminals. And that's just because they have the most visible products and services and they're, they're widespread. Um, now, this also means um, the, the cyber attacks uh, have an average cost of $18.3 million for every business in, in the financial sector which is the highest uh, overall globally. Wow, that's remarkable. And I recall there was a story pre-COVID, it was around 2016, hackers targeting the Central Bank of Bangladesh. There were some vulnerabilities in SWIFT there, which is the global financial system's main electronic payment system. They tried to steal, I think the figure was like a billion US dollars. They did manage to get away with just over $100 million. That, that's still unaccounted for. So I think that was really, for right. me, the big wake-up call that this is the new kind of bank heist, isn't it? What do you see as the most <clears throat> common attack vectors that these uh, threat actors are using? It is, and you're, you're completely right. Um, so cyber criminals are increasingly exploiting IoT blind spots, right? The IoT and IIoT are so widespread now. Um, they, they also exploit privacy loopholes for mo mobile and cloud jacking, networks, software vulnerabilities. You know, supply chain becomes an issue um, um, now in the last year or so. 
and after the solar winds breach uh, it's it's got even more publicity mm-hmm. social engineering is still used um, heavily used so it's a tactic that's used by threat actors um to uh, on unwary users who upload download receive and usually they they just work on a day to day basis uh, basis with uh, productivity file inside the threats it's also one of the big ones uh, in 2020 according to verizon um uh, it accounted for 30% of the breaches um so organizations need to limit the user access they need to detect um or block sensitive information they need to audit they need to track role based access and of course they need to encrypt um uh, store data if against malicious insiders or for some sort of um, mistake by an employee Mm-hmm. Just like you mentioned, right? Sponsored attacks uh, on financial firms are increasingly uh, being targeted by nation states. Um, you mentioned the bank, Bangladesh heist. Um, you know, I think everybody that's in cybersecurity now knows about the Lazarus Group. Uh, so they have specialized in those type of activities. Um, the reasons. Um, you know it can be a spionage it can be uh, to disrupt or uh, destabilize the economy or even um, intelligence gathering cyber crime is an industry right we we like it or not um, it has its own service economy tools for hire solution providers and even end users right uh, is more profitable than the actual combined uh, illegal drug um, trade and it's been considered you know the greatest transfer of economic wealth in history um there's been some studies that uh, try to measure the impact of um cyber crime not specific to finance but as a whole um there's been predictions that say that at the end of 2020 it would probably total over 6 trillion US dollars if we would consider that the gdp of a country it would be the third largest economy in the world after us and china so it is that big fine um, sounds now sorry go ahead no i was just going to say it, you know it sounds to me like with such uh, a lucrative and sophisticated industry that uh, targets are almost on a hiding to nothing here i was going to say how can financial services organizations protect themselves against such serious and overwhelming threats yeah it's it's so widespread so everybody has to maybe ask several questions right um things like how many restrictions can you add without impacting the productivity Mm-hmm. how much can you rely on user training right and how many of those users that you train are actually going to implement the training or uh, the lessons they've learned um you know one very important thing is are you validating the files as a business do you do any pre-processing of those files uh but also you have to consider your use case right um you have to understand uh do you need files uploaded on your portal for example or on your mobile banking applications and what files do you need uh, right if you're simply receiving scan documents or you collaborate with third parties on all kind of draft agreements um why would you allow pdf with embedded javascript in it right or um can you make sure can you trust a document that contains hyperlink macros and active access controls for example but it's one thing to decide that any file containing scripts or macros should not enter an an organization but it's a totally different thing trying to apply that policy and enforce it right it's mm-hmm. difficult to determine exactly what the file contains without opening it so therefore further steps are necessary to defend against malicious uh, files disguised as common productivity files well george <clears throat> i can certainly see considering how we've been talking about things like open banking uh um, APIs that kind of thing that this is increasingly going to become an important consideration if we're going to deliver on this promise of opening up the back end architecture to deliver customers and and that's really what uh, businesses are looking to do when you look at the best practice here um you mentioned people and we still have social engineering as a significant uh, vector uh, what are the best practices that uh, you're recommending for financial services firms should they be running drills with their people to just ensure that this culture of cybersecurity really lands inside an organization It's definitely a mix of different things, right? But 
the best thing is to start with the so-called low-hanging fruits, right? Mm. So we can start with by only allowing certain file types or file formats, let's say. While this sounds really uh, easy to do, some organizations don't do it, right? So uh, avoiding unnecessary risks by just filtering what types of files enter your organization. The idea is to uh, block any file that has no impact on your team's productivity um, in order to avoid unnecessary risks, right? That's not going to eliminate, um, you know, the, the big part of, of, of the cyber threats, but it's a good start, right? Also, um, following um, fo uh, fo uh, a follow-up to that is to block unnecessary file types, disguise, disguise files and spoof files, right? So you have to identify the true file type. While, while you do that filtering, you have to make sure the file type is of its true, uh, so you don't have to just rely on the extension because that can mm -hmm. easily be spoofed. I, I'm pretty sure every one of us at some point had to change the extension of a file to just be able to send it over Gmail, right? Uh, so especially with the, the simplified interface of contemporary operating systems, you don't even see the extension if you open a web browser, uh, if you open your, your file explorer windows, that's not visible. So users, you know, can be easily tricked by that. Also preventing um, document type declaration attacks. So all the complex files allow document type declaration, uh, which are prone to different, uh, very popular uh, attacks like uh, external uh, XML external entity, uh, DOS, server side request forgery, and so on. Uh, those are part of the OWASP top 10, uh, which obviously every organization should, should implement. Um, and don't make the exception a rule, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just just don't allow everybody to have access to everything, right? If only your design team needs access to PSD file or AI files, uh, just make sure only them uh, have access to that. Yeah, I've worked inside organizations where everyone seems to have a, a, a key to the front door, it would seem, and, and certainly are not following those uh, fastidiously. Now, how can OpsWat help those organizations uh, protect themselves? Uh, what do you actually do? So OpsWat is committed to prevent threats and zero-day attacks uh, for secure data transfer across network, application, and you know the ongoing customer operation. Um, we, we have two decades of experience in securing critical infrastructure systems. And what we provide, especially for the finance industry, it's uh, the opportunity to protect that KYC process, know your customer, where mm. um, you know, different people have access to a web portal or, or, or a mobile banking application to upload files. And what we do is secure those files against malware. We do that through different technologies. So we provide a software that customers uh, install and host uh, in their network. So there's no cloud connection to it. Uh, no data is shared. And the software allows uh, our customers to scan all the files that are being uploaded with multiple antivirus engines at once. So we can provide up to 34 different antivirus engines for the customers to scan those file uploads. On top of that, we provide another technology. It's a fantastic technology called Deep CDR. Uh, CDR stands for Content Disarm and Reconstruction. And what the technology does, it's essentially assuming all files are potentially malicious and it just de-weaponizes them. So it removes those active components that I've just mentioned earlier that can actually run code while user open the file. It just removes those completely. So that's our technology to block uh, zero days, right? It's like we've, we've all heard zero trust um, as a philosophy uh, that's applied to you know, user access. Um, it's like zero trust technology for file security, essentially, the deep CDR, right? It's a pure prevention technology. And by combination, uh, in combination with multi-scanning, which is uh, you know, pure detection, number of um, AV engines being so high, which leads to a high detection rate. Uh, our mm. platform can secure against all different kind, kind of attacks, sp state sponsored, you know, um, or the, the trivial, um, you know, downloaded malware from the dark web. Uh, 
Um, so we have the, the actual technology to help customers. Um, we can scan emails with this technology. Um, we, we literally can secure every data entry point in terms of, of, of uh, cybersecurity for our customers. Well, I think it, when it comes it, to mm. no, carry on. Uh, just just one last thing. When it comes to our presence in South Africa, we obviously already have uh, existing customers in the banking sector, uh, where we help with their you know cloud adoption strategy in terms of security. Uh, but we also have a, a local partner uh, in in the name of Altron Arrow. So they are our sort of saying extended arm in South Africa. And, you know, if anyone's interested in finding more about the OPSA technology and how we can help, um, I do encourage them to reach out to, to um, Altron Arrow for, for maybe setting up um, a proper discussion around the technology. Yeah, I think uh, that Altron Arrow brand, very well known here in the South African market uh, as they were ably led by Mteta and Yati. And I think just this unprecedented digital transformation, banks competing with tech companies, tech companies competing with banks. Meanwhile, the pandemic on the background has really heightened demand for online financial services. It's made work from home arrangements the norm. That opens up new threat uh, possibilities. And then central banks around the globe considering throwing their weights behind digital currencies and modernizing payment system. It's a time of rapid transformation. And I think this is a time when incident could easily undermine trust and derail a lot of those innovations. So cyber, cyber security, I think, is more essential now than it's uh, ever been, George. And it sounds like Opswat has got some uh, great solutions uh, to help uh, firms who are concerned about this. So thanks so much for sharing that with us here at the Business Tech Fintech Conference uh, for 2022. Take care.